Hello, I'm Robin Schuldenfrey, Tangen Senior Lecturer and 20th Century Modernism here at the Courthold Institute of Art. I'd like to warmly welcome you to our lecture by Professor Pamela Karimi from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Her lecture today, titled Radical Alternatives, Temporal and Spatial Mediations in Contemporary Iranian Art, is being hosted under the auspices of the Architecture Cultures Cluster here at the Courthold, as well as my ongoing lecture series, Modernities, Architecture, Design, Theory. We are being hosted by the Research Forum of the Courthold, and I'd like to especially thank the Courthold for its support and the entire Research Forum team for their work behind the scenes. Following Professor Karimi's lecture, we welcome you to join in the discussion and the question and answer session. To pose questions, we will enable the chat function at the bottom of your screen so that you might type in questions. Or if you'd like to ask the question in person, we very much welcome you to do that in person by using the raise hand function um, also on your screen. And we will spotlight you so you may come um, into the discussion. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Karimi, who is an architect, an architectural historian, and an associate professor at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. She's the author of Domesticity and Consumer Culture in Iran, Interior Revolutions of the Modern Era, and co-editor of the volume, The Destruction of Cultural Heritage in the Middle East from Napoleon to ISIS. Her, her edited special journal issues include images of the child and childhood in modern Muslim contexts, as well as reinventing the American post-industrial city. Karimi's curatorial projects include Black Spaces Matter, which traveled to several venues, and the show Contemporary Iranian Art and the Historical Imagination. Recently, she was the co-recipient of a Connecting Art Histories initiative at the Getty Foundation, where she is part of a team exploring the topic, mapping art histories in the Arab world, Iran, and Turkey. Today's lecture is part of her upcoming book uh, project on the alternative art scene in Iran. Her working title is Alternative Iran, Radical Interventions in Art, Design, and Politics. Please welcome Pamela Karimi. Hi, Robin. Thank you for this um, kind introduction. So with your permission, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Writers and journalists, most of whom reside outside Iran, have a term for post-revolutionary places where unconventional alternative non-conformist and grassroots activities take place. They call them zirzamini, which literally means of the underground. The global perception that such unofficial activities in Iran take place in secretive and underground spaces was particularly bolstered after the publication of Azar Nafisi's best-selling memoir, Reading Lolita in Tehran, which is a fictional adaptation of Nafisi's personal life in Tehran in the early years of the Islamic Republic, in which she taught her students books that were banned at the university. Additionally, films such as Bahman Qobadi's No One Knows About Persian Cats vividly illustrated the dilemmas faced by underground rock music bands in Tehran. While dramatized, these stories are not completely fictitious. However, unlike what the sensationalist media projects, most of what happens in Iran's private spheres is not entirely unlawful or in opposition to the regime, a view that has also been challenged, this view of being against the regime or resisting the system has been challenged recently by anthropologist Susanna Olveska and music scholars Ladan Nushin, Nahid Siam Dust, and Theresa Stewart. Many art experts inside Iran admit that while there is a bit of undergroundness in every activity outside the purview of the government, nothing is completely hidden or illegal. They even disagree on the usage of the term. Artist and founding director of Azad Art Gallery, Rosita Sharaf Jahan, indicates that the term underground, Zir Zamini, is actually never used for unofficial and private art galleries in Iran. 
Instead, these private spaces with quote unquote trusted audiences are called showrooms. In theater, such spaces are referred to as Tatra Apartemani, apartment theater, or Tatra Khane, house theater, and the list goes on. Because of this, when referring to art that takes place in, official, in unofficial spaces, most Iranian experts, such as critics Haliya Darabi or Puya Jahanshad, who work and publish in Iran, prefer terms such as informal, Rasmi, and alternative, Jai Gazim. It is due to these that I have chosen the word radical alternatives for the title of this talk referring to artists who make creative usage of the space, many of which are either private or covert or inconsequential and short-lived. It is therefore apt to think of all of them in terms of degrees of spatial and temporal visibilities and invisibilities instead of legality or illegality or resistance against the dominant establishment. This point is particularly important because as we know, alternative art spaces of the West have often been very visible. Think, for instance, of this venue among the very many that animated New York art scenes throughout the 1970s. Visibility was at the forefront of AIR, which was one of the earliest um, galleries founded by feminists. These spaces were visible in order to, to mimic, and I'm paraphrasing Martin Beck, the conditions of the art market and thereby create an alternative insight to the system. Unique to the alternative art scenes in New York, this model does not work in Iran. Instead, to maintain their alternative character, many have to lean towards relative invisibility or what I call loose covertness. In this way, many alternative art spaces in Iran evoke the loose covert art spaces of the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc. Take, for instance, the Soviet apt art, which, as you know, is a combination of the English apartment and art, a collective of artists, including Ilya Kabakov, who organized quote unquote anti shows using their own financial means and private apartments. Subsequently, the appropriation of homes and off-site spaces as art venues became somewhat common. This is, for example, um, the space of the alternative group Kindergarten, who took their name from the space in which they worked and presented their work, which was formerly um, a kindergarten, but gradually became um, a, um, an unfunctional space, a dilapidated space, and they continued to work there. And I had the privilege to interview several members of this group and learn about parallels with work of Iranian artists in similar, in similar dilapidated spaces. So in a similar fashion, post-revolutionary Iranian time-based urban art projects are also more on a par with practices that surfaced in the authoritarian public spaces of the Eastern Bloc. One iconic example in this vein, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is this temporary piece, The Demolition for All Senses by the Czech artist Milan Kiznik. With its subtle political message and playful nature, it conjures the multifaceted dimensions of Iranian time-based art and performances in urban spaces. In the realm of theater and performance art, Iran Iranian practitioners have long been influenced by the work of Polish director Jerzy Grotowski and the Polish experimental theater Gardzinetsi that chose unconventional spaces away from the watchful eyes of the authorities. This presentation, as Robin kindly mentioned, is part of a book project that is now categorized into these chapters, invisibility, escapism, ephemerality, and improvisation. In the interest of time, I have categorized my presentation today into different um, groups. And uh, the first of them is art and spatial politics in post-revolutionary Iran. 
Before I um, get into the details of art practices in dilapidated buildings um, um, after the Islamic Revolution, I just wanted to remind our audiences that the usage of alternative art spaces and sites um, um, has a longer history. It's not um, uh, um, just a post-revolutionary phenomenon. In fact, before the revolution, um, at the Shiraz Festival of the Arts, many um, uh, international and local artists actually chose unconventional venues, including an entire mountain, which was appropriated by um, American artist Robert Wilson and turned into an installation project. As well, many um, theater performance groups, uh, both local and international, appropriated old mansions and performed in um, these homes, which was obviously very different from uh, uh, the standard theatrical stage. After the revolution, many, um, again, unconventional venues, such as um, spaces of religious minorities, such as churches and synagogues, became venues uh, for uh, music performances and art exhibitions. As well, many um, uh, basements in people's homes became art galleries, and over time, they actually became official galleries. So uh, many uh, current galleries in Tehran actually were formerly part of the residential space, um, um, and now uh, they have all um, gained permission and they have become official galleries. The history of installations in abandoned and dilapidated buildings, otherwise known as Kolangi in Iran, goes back to 1992 when a group of young painters took over a three-story residential complex in the posh northern Tehran Pasdaran Avenue. The house belonged to the family of one of the artists and had been left vacant, awaiting to be revamped and turned into a taller residential complex. And this is part of a phenomenon that took place in Iran after the end of the Iran-Iraq war in 1988. Between 1989 and 99, based on the Chinese and Malaysian development models, a new pseudo neoliberal model was created for um, economy in Iran. And I call it pseudo neoliberal because as you know, Iran is not part of the global economy because of the sanctions and other reasons. So these models were adopted by President Ali Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani, and they affected urban development in Iran, specifically in Tehran. It was during this decade that many old villas and historic buildings were demolished and replaced by taller, more profitable buildings that could also accommodate more people, more residential spaces for the residents of Tehran. But they were also extremely profitable for the real estate agents and others who were involved in urban development. According to Sasan Nasiri, the artists who participated in this show in this dilapidated building that was awaiting demolition to be replaced by a taller building the artists spent time there creating a private artistic colony where they could enjoy an atmosphere detached from the rest of the city and where they could use models, paint at night, and play music. Later, the building became a venue for an installation called Kargai Honar Maser, Independent Contemporary Art Workshop, otherwise known as Project 71, referring to the Iranian calendar 1371, which is 1992. The exhibition was conceptual and ephemeral, what is called in Iran, honare uh, mira, or literally art that dies. The works were created with the intention of being destroyed and the group did not expect to make money out of the show. Even when some experts suggested cutting pieces from the walls and taking them into galleries and museums, the group resisted. Shahrukh Qiyasi created a group of mythical figures under the stair alcoves. Calligrapher Yusuf Rezaei populated the whole surface of the floor with pseudo calligraphic writings. And I apologize, I don't, I do not have any images of these um, of these things because they didn't uh, document them properly. 
Nasiri and Farid Jahangir took over the second floor where Jahangir painted, painted a long glass supper table that wrapped around the main living room. Apparently, these were the friends of the artists who were included in this peculiar rendition of The Last Supper. On that same second floor, Nasiri took over the kitchen and a few other rooms. He placed broken ceramics and found furniture around the rooms and encouraged audiences to break them. Among all presentations, Mustafa Dashdi's work was probably the most sensual. And I do apologize again, I do have any images of that time. And this is Dashdi, this is a more recent photograph from Dashdi's own website. Dashdi, who had immersed himself in making Turner style abstract paintings that is slightly hinted at oil products or vast landscapes tainted by fossil fuels, decided to turn the fifth floor of the Kolangi building into a dark room. To make the matters more explicit, he even brought a few old found barrels into the show and placed them in the midst of the rooms. The walls were animated by Dashti's paintings and importantly, they were all painted black. Using powerful pumps and pistols to make his criticism of pollution in Tehran more evident, before the opening, he also asked a few of his friends to smoke cigarettes inside and had the whole space filled with fumes. The entire space was dark, even the windows were solid, but a small threshold on one window with a view towards the city below invited visitors to see Tehran and its polluted skyline. During its display, the show also included a couple of private events, including a dance session coordinated by filmmaker Bahman Farman Farma. Like a swirling dervish, a female dancer performed on the aforementioned calligraphically animated floor. This performance piece was completely private and only open to a few trusted audiences. The rest of the show was, however, open to the public. More than 2,000 visitors attended the show, according to a required questionnaire left at the door. Iranian filmmaker, um, Rakhshan Bariyatemad made a short documentary about the event, but the film unfortunately never found its way into the public until very recently in 2019, when art historian Helia Darabi finally digitized the film and showcased it at the Iran Shahar Gallery. Unfortunately, again, I don't have access to that film. The group had not been successful in securing permission from the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, and after the show received the attention of a few foreign journalists, some from the ministry showed up and questioned the group and then shut down the whole event. So it only lasted for 10 days. In 1995, artist Humana Mortazavi, also part of the same circle of friends and artists who were working in these spaces, organized another similar show in a dilapidated villa in northern Tehran titled Life Accessories. Mortezavi was a young artist whose work was known to and respected by a few existing gallerists, but he insisted on making his art in an alternative space. Mortezavi managed to reserve a slot at the vacant and dilapidated home of Soleiman Behboudi, a high-ranking official in Reza Shah's court. But the home of a high-ranking political figure and a confidant of Reza Shah became an art venue for Mortezavi was a mere coincidence and the artist did not make any effort to make references to this history or the political connotations of it. For Marta Zavi, the desire to find a large private exhibition was more important. He told me, when I got there, I did whatever the hell I wanted. I tore the wallpapers, painted the windows, even destroyed some sections of the interior. I could not have possibly done this anywhere else. This is what alternative sites offered to us. They offered us our freedom. To appreciate how cutting edge these forms of art exhibitions were, one needs to acknowledge that something as simple as installation art or something which is known as Honare Chideman in Iran was at the time considered Zionist in character and was not permitted in official museums, as one art history professor told me. Despite his efforts, Mortazavi was unable to secure permission from the ministry. In fact, he recalls the ridicule and intimidation he encountered upon seeking 
permission. Not only did they think that such a form of art presentation was unnecessary, but it, they also did not have any barometer to evaluate the degree to which this form of art was decent for public viewing. Indeed, their standards were defined within the limited categories of painting, sculpture, theater, and film, and they had no ways of measuring the quality of an installation project in an off-site location. Several times during the course of the show, the authorities came by and demanded its closure. Mortezavi was asked to explain his intention, um, and he cleverly denigrated his own art to the level of kardasti, which literally means handmade, a term often attributed to children's craft works for school projects. It's important to note that uh, many other artists um, uh, denigrate their art when they uh, confront the authorities. For example, uh, music performance in unofficial locations claim that their work is or experimental performance for university projects, and, they and thereby they're allowed to continue their work. Despite this, I mean, the fact that he denigrated his art to the level of Kardasti, Mortazavi was forced to shut down the exhibition after 10 days. Another of these Kolangi exhibitions took place in 1998. This time it was properly documented through a film called Honare Tahrib or Art of Demolition by Maziar Bahari, who kindly offered um, a copy of the film to me. Whether these works were political or not is debatable. All the artists involved insisted that they had absolutely no interest in politics. Additionally, while many of these early works were only site oriented, they were not at all site specific. It was only later that site specific projects emerged. In 2006, on the verge of Ahmadinejad's election as president of the Islamic Republic, and the passing of new laws that would further limit journalists, the abandoned former headquarters of the most prominent state run Iranian newspaper, Etelaat, became a platform for a monumental installation by artist Farideh Shah Savarani. Shah Savarani spent nine months exploring different options for making an installation project inside the empty building. Instead of aiming for the usual posh gallery spaces, Shah Savarani thought this Kalangi building was a perfect platform for an art project that would invite ordinary people from all walks of life. After drawing many sketches and fabricating storyboards, she finally came up with an original plan for an installation entitled, I Wrote, You Read. In collaboration with several construction laborers and students, Shah Savarani worked around the clock for 20 consecutive days to prepare the space. Shah Savarani, who did not secure permission for the project from the authorities, was worried about the possible outbreak of tensions and therefore held the show for only one week. Shah Savarani's work was a commentary on suppression of journalists, which had reached its peak after enjoying eight years of relative freedom during the time of President Khatami. Visitors who came to the show walked through the halls and interacted with newspapers. Some newspapers were trapped in barbed wire stands, some simply covered the walls and windows and ceilings, and others were shown in a series of original videos that also produced the sounds of typewriters and sirens. This Gesamtkunstwerk, or total work of art, engaged multiple human senses, affirming a form of viewing that according to many cognitive psychologists depends not only on our eyes, but also on our bodies. As the bodies moved through these repressive spaces, they became more agitated and feelings of rage and unhappiness moved from architectural entities and objects to bodies and from bodies to other bodies and from bodies back to the objects themselves. The project thus entered an emotive economy to borrow from Sarah Ahmed, who asserts that emotions are not just private sentiments but rather move within and through bodies and objects and therefore produce publicly shared effective economies. 
One viewer was caught holding on to newspaper covered piers and crying. A few were discovered lying on the floor, allegedly mourning for their loved ones in the media industry who had gotten into trouble. Two university students brought a blindfolded friend to the installation and asked her to report on her feelings about the space, which is not very positive, but she reported on the space, the sounds and the overall tactile features of the ensemble. The work of Shah Savarani marked a radical shift in engagement with the site. She widened the concept of the site, not only to forefront aesthetic merits, but also to highlight the site's social and political connotations. This site specificity has only recently gained a firm foothold. Another example in this vein includes an intriguing dilapidated structure in which graffiti artist Parham, Parham Alamdar created his art. The setting was formerly a teeny house, a group house or a covert house that had been used by members of the left, notably the communist two-day party of Iran. These homes were created by the left because of the restrictions created by the Shah's regime and later on during and after the Islamic revolution, the homes were used by the left. As time went by, went on, the utilization of these homes became increasingly sophisticated. Although family oriented and straightforward, they became the hub of some of the most radical activities of the party, including, for example, print shops for uh, the publication of political posters and pamphlets. By inscribing Siyah Mashq, which is a form of calligraphic writing that is devoid of meaning, Alamdar expressed his desire in what he called anti-narrative, zedde and desacralization, taqaddusodai, of Islamic calligraphy. In this way, Qalamdar expressed his interest in the unfolding drama of history and how in modern Iran, this history has always been subjugated by authoritative mega-narratives. Despite its significant site specificity and aesthetic merits, Qalamdar Timi House project was only created for himself and a few of his graffiti artist friends. This is art as a liberating source in its best possible form. Indeed, this form of graffiti art performed in private and covert spaces is art in its most alternative and anti-institutionalized form. Interventionist. In character, this art can never become integrationist, to put it in terminologies used by art historian Mian Cohen, who has a very um, famous book about site specificity in Western art. Kalamdar made maps of such interventionalist covert art projects that he did throughout the city of Tehran. The places where him and his friends worked are identifiable through a series of splashing red marks reminiscent of blood stains. As such, these marks call to mind the violence of the past decades. The red spots also signify the civil rights that are currently constantly violated. The counter map of Tehran, which you can see here, evokes the maps made by the Situationist International Group who delineated paths that vastly exceeded the boundaries set by state officials and authorities in 1960s Europe. Some of the marks on Alamdar's maps are casually labeled, identifying the neighborhoods in which the graffiti art or covert public art projects were created. Other stains are not labeled, and as such, the maps project the tentativeness of many public art activities that take place in Iran. There's always a sense of uncertainty about these projects. They're simultaneously legal and illegal, public and private, visible and invisible. Concurrent with the rise of Kolangi spaces, came the unconventional spaces employed by theater artists. Nargis Sia, an art group, um, a theater group, which was active from 96 to 2000, also, you know, in English, their names means um, Black Narcissus, was the first theater group in Iran to perform in an unconventional space. 
in 96, director Hamed Mohammad Tahiri aimed for producing plays that were more than just the repetition of canonical classical European plays such as Hamlet. Influenced by the teachings of Grotowski, Tahiri believed in creative adaptation of old plays, as well as extreme bodily movements that engaged the viewer in an emotional way. Above all, he was influenced by Grotowski's notion of poor theater, which came to stand for a performance style that rid itself of the excessive theater, the lavish costumes and detailed sets. Censor, centered on the skills of the actors and performed with only a handful of props, Tahiri's poor theater necessitated alternative stages. In this case, the furnace room or motorkhane of the city theater, the most famous theater venue in Tehran, official theater venue. Nargis Siyah was devoid of any overt political messages. Despite this, its life was short. Later, many theater groups followed suit. For instance, when rejected by the annual Fajr Theater Festival, which is a festival of theater um, sponsored by the government, Noir Art Group chose the open arena outside Tehran's city theater, where the festival approved performances took place. More radical approaches to theater came after the 2009 Green Movement. Mohammad Reza Yerad was an established theater director which, with a rich portfolio, but he was arrested during the 2009 uprisings and his license was revoked. To avoid depression caused by his joblessness, he told me, he formed an independent house theater group. Plays were performed inside private homes and trusted audiences were invited. This tradition continues to this day. This is the work of Hossein Tabazonizadeh, a young theater director who works in dilapidated homes in central Tehran. All of his work have permission from the government. The work include performances by a series of artists who actually perform in these dilapidated homes and they're only for um, a, a limited group of audiences. When audiences uh, come into the house, um, the performers actually improvise and they even engage the audiences into the play. So each play is different depending on how the audiences actually respond to, um, uh, to the story. And so my point is that uh, that idea of, of performing in homes has now become um, a style in theatrical performances of, um, of Tehran. In 2012, the Av Theater Group, which had been active since 2009 in outdoor spaces, decided to create a space for itself in Tehran. They acquired permission from the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance to perform in this underground thermal bath in Tehran. The founders of the, of the group, Sohila Arabi and Babak Mehri, had previously traveled to Poland to learn from the experimental theater of that country, otherwise known as Gardzinetsi, which was actually influenced by Jerzy Grotowski himself. They opted for this thermal bath because according to Arabi, it's wet and moldy and humid environment gave a subterranean feel to the space. Arabi adds, it almost looked like another planet. The space was timeless, all dark and humid and very much unlike the dry polluted and always sunny overground city. There was no cell phone reception down there, no contacts with the outside world, and the group would walk into the space early in the morning, and by the time they left, it was already dark out there. They lost the sense of time. To make this space even more otherworldly, they even brought a few bags of beach sand and turned the floors into natural looking environments. All they wanted was to create a subterranean and natural setting like a cave. Down there, Arabi told me, everything turned into performance. It was truly life as art or art as life. Often referred to as the temporal turn in contemporary art, the idea is motivated by images, sounds, and performances that artistically explain as art historian Christine Ross conveys contemporary experiences of temporal discontinuity and inconsistency. Prime cl classic examples in this vein are Happenings by Alan Caprow, as you all know, 
Durational art in Iran is also aligned with Jacques Derrida's concept of out of joint temporality, which has the capacity to disrupt the order of things. In this context, temporality can become synonymous with subtle political action. Executing performance art in public spaces in Iran is not always easy, and there are many instances of interrogation by the moral police. In 2005, Human Mortazavi, who was also involved in the earlier Kolangi projects, as I mentioned here in this presentation, created the Mobazi or Parallel, parallel Project. Mortazavi was uh, Mobazi. The parallel project was based on a principle of participatory budgeting through which Mortazavi and his colleagues invited a group of artists to fund the project and materialize it within a designated period of time. At first, the group contemplated creating elaborate sculptures out of recycled materials by the busy sidewalks of Tehran. But it soon became clear that they had to create quick projects or else they would be troubled. Mortazavi recalls that they had to install gorilla style, in a gorilla style way, Nasbe or Nasbe Cheriki, as they had to leave the scene immediately after the installment. Notable among these projects is one spearheaded by Mortazavi himself, through which he, -create, he, he created um, uh, roadside stands reminiscent of those used by fruit, ice, and vegetable vendors. Instead of using the typical signage that describes the produce type and its price, Mortazavi scribed words um, such as trust, the stability, silence, calm, and security, words that by his own accounts are missing from urban life. Alongside the internationally, um, they, they intentionally, they intentionally um, implemented temporality of this art exists other forms of temporalities that are forced by the authorities. Puya Aryanpur is known for his provocative Ainekari, mirror work sculptures. Other artists before Aryanpur, as many of you know, most notably Monir Shahrudi Farman Farmayan, have used mirror works in their sculptures. Popularized in the Qajar period, Ainekari became associated with the inner sanctum of Shiite shrines or Imamzadehs. Upon entering, one is met with a dazzling array of small geometrical mirrors set on the walls and ceilings that presumably allow the believer to, quote unquote, transcend all worldly things and become one with the divine. Interestingly, Ainakari enshrines takes the form of shattered pieces, so fractured that one's reflection is skewed and urgently an urgency drawn from the teachings of the highest ranking Shiite clerics that prevent praying in front of portraits, including one's own portrait or image. And other scholars have done research about this, uh, but in the interest of time, I don't mention this, uh, these sources. With this background in mind, Aryanpur decided to deconstruct the whole concept. In Beautiful Virgin from 2015, he reinvented Ainakari to contradict and subvert the original sacred associations by substituting the sacred with the earthly. In doing so, he did not necessarily go against the intrinsic logic of Ainakari. For him, the technique is all about constant concealment, penhonkari emodavem and hence provides possibilities for distorting what is considered taboo. When presented at the Golestan Palace Museum in 2017 as part of a larger exhibition, the museum staff did not notice the implemented sarcasm and they all admired the art. However, later on, a staff uh, noticed the problem and they rushed to place a shroud over it. This addition prompted people's curiosity, leading them to remove the shroud to see the hidden parts. Unable to swiftly remove the piece from the room due to the practical reasons stemming from its size and weight, officials then decided to place a divider in front of the ensemble, thus thwarting visitors from touching the work that looked like a woman's sexual part. In the exhibition's catalog, they darkened the center of this vagina 
and on the website, the piece is shown only partially. Thus was the fate of this artwork, from a sacred looking object to a profane image, and interestingly enough, also an interactive art or performance piece, one that generated various acts of censorship, self-censorship, curiosity. Intriguingly, the project was also turned in, uh, turned its turned its creator into an ethnographer of censorship rituals in Iran. Aryampur began to see how the various actors in line uh, uh, with their concerns, intentions, strategies, or interests created meanings by engaging with this artwork. In other words, the activity surrounding the, his art exemplified the very means by which Iranian artists, censors, viewers negotiate, redefine, or reconstruct new readings and offer participating viewpoints. In this way, his art is not what one staff member um, understood to be Juanare Eterozi or protest art. Rather, it invited all kinds of agents and actors to interact with it and make meanings out of it. The creation of alternative art venues is closely tied to alternative curation. These curatorial strategies reveal a great deal about the politics of inclusion and exclusion and the hierarchy of institutional practices. There are indeed daring and highly intellectual examples such as the Y Art Studio. This venue is known among artist circles as one of the private galleries that has dared to show um, and sold nude or partially nude works. That the posters and invitation cards um, of this venue highlight an axonometric view of the gallery space alludes to the significance of the spatial agency of the venue allocated for these private art events. The founder and director of Y Art Studio Aida Vakilian launched the gallery on Posh Gandhi Street in 2010. From early on, the incentive behind Y was to provide artists a space to present their artworks that are permissive, that are not permissible in conventional art galleries and museums. Additionally, Vakilian believed that many artists in Iran are habitual self-censors. They produce art in a society and culture that does not appreciate directness. Y was created with the intention of operating like a private assembly, and although Vakilian secured permission from the ministry, she did it under her own name. First and foremost, because Y is a Latin word and you cannot secure permission for galleries with foreign names, and also because Vakilian wanted to be mobile. Vakilian does not see her activities as political. Instead, she sees them as a kind of ethnographic testing of Iranian society. Amid the private circumstances that granted her relative freedom, Vakilian curated this project, Irma, and Irma doesn't mean anything actually. She picked the female model for this project and sent her to 30 selected artists. Vakilian asked them to make art based on her, and they were all given the freedom to do whatever they wanted to do with this model, who is called by Vakilian as Asiri woman, a word that is used in modern Persian literature, specifically by Sadaq Hidayat, as a woman who is attractive and present, but unreachable. The choice of the character, coupled with the curatorial strategy, calls to mind Marina Abramovich's Rhythm Zero, Rhythm Zero from 1974. Similar to this project, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into the details of that, hoping that many of you are familiar with this famous work, Vakilian tested her artists. She said to me, I wanted to know how far they could go with the concept, and ironically, none of them did anything provocative. As I had predicted, they all remained within the confined boundaries of artistic expression in Iran. No one had a bold jasurane approach. They all respected the boundaries. No one portrayed the model nude or did anything out of the ordinary. Cautiousness, mohavizikari, according to Bakilian, is a fact of life in Iranian art and life. Described by the former Tehran bureau chief for New York Times, Thomas Erdbrink, as the son of a wealthy banker who looks like a typical aspiring Iranian artist, 
wearing ripped jeans and riding a taxi instead of a Maserati, Ehsan Rasulov is arguably one of the most powerful voices behind current art scenes in Tehran. Known commonly for owning and directing the Mohsen Gallery, which was established in 2010, Rasulov is also responsible for creating and spearheading several alternative art institutions and residencies that have energized Tehran's art scenes since 2010. The single vision behind Rasulov art enterprise is what he calls Tose'e Sakhtafzari, hardware expansion. Akin to the ideas of the Dutch artist Jonas Stahl, who helps us see how architecture can become the source for civil action, Rasulov believes in the power of architecture in its brick and mortar form or physical appearance, what he calls sort de physique, in the expansion of democratic spaces for exchange of ideas and the civil society. This way of thinking spurred the creation of Darbast in 2012, a black box on Mir Damad Street. Most notably, Darbast has become an overground venue for formerly underground music bands such as Palette. Since the summer of 2010, Rasulov has created Pelak project. And Pelak means a number designated to a house or a business in Iran. The idea was developed in collaboration with media artist and filmmaker Mohammad Parvizi, who suggested treating a visual art exhibition venue like a film set. The film crew, according to Rasulov and Parvizi, constantly searches for a new venue for, uh, to stage their plots. Similarly, uh, they use this concept in order to create um, art, specifically site-specific projects. In doing so, Rasulov and Parvizi attempt to engage and interact with the city in a larger scale and with an approach that alters each time around. In one of our conversations, Parvizi told me, the life of the mind is none other than an underground existence. Actually, he said, the life of my mind is none other than an underground existence, or ziste zirzanini. This powerful statement sums up the reality of his plan for Pelak and many other similar alternative alt venues in Tehran. Instead of going completely underground in a physical sense, most creative agents think in the underground and then find ways to translate their thoughts into a form that is passable above ground, often with permission from the authorities. Thus, the Kalangi projects that were presented covertly back in the 1990s have now found official sponsored sponsors. Once again, as an architect enthusiast, Rasulov also sees a potential in activating leftover spaces within official galleries. Since Mohsen Gallery began its work, its front yard, its, pa its patio or patio, and its roof were never fully realized at platforms for artistic presentation. In 2015, Rasulov took it upon himself to create Mohsen projects in three spaces of Hayat, or the front yard, Bomb, the roof, and Pasio, or the greenhouse, with the aim of challenging the conventional white cube of art exhibitions as well as the left spa leftover spaces from the gallery's form former function as a modernist house. These leftover spaces came about as a result of forced modernist design visions or, or what Henri Lefebvre calls in his book, the production of space as abstract spaces. And these in Iran include spaces such as balconies that due to lack of privacy remain useless in traditional families or patios that are left empty. They collect mold and they were implemented in lieu of traditional courtyard. I am receiving uh, a message, um, I think, uh, that, that must be something about time. I'm going to be finishing Robin uh, very, very shortly, like maybe within the next two or three minutes. Another way of using leftover spaces is evident through Rasulov's Napshi. And this is a gallery slash bookstore. Um, and this one, as you can see um, on the website of um, the Napshi, 
uh, Rasulov is making references uh, to spaces that were par uh, part of the, um, the uh, traditional Iranian courtyard house, as well as um, some other spaces such as Panagha. Uh, the statement um, here on the web uh, website refers to large underground air raid shelter, which was created underneath the house um, uh, front yard for usage of the occupants and their neighbors during uh, the Iran-Iraq war. The architectural spaces within the traditional courtyard house, such as Sardab, a cool summer room in the home's basement, or Pastu, a storage house, uh, to a large extent had lost their meanings um, in daily life of people during the time of the Shah when forced modernization happened. During the revolution and war, such traditional spaces became once again useful as they performed as bomb shelters and other protective means. That Rasulov underscores the significance of these spaces by their traditional functions and associated names is an ingenious way to address how his privately run enterprise, Nafshi, helped bring the underground culture to the fore. By the way, there are other examples of um, such uses um, of traditional spaces, um, notably the Abambar Gallery, uh, which has been um, created in the, in the uh, underground water reservoir uh, of an old house in Tehran, or the electric room and extension of uh, the Astan Gallery, which makes use of an electric room um, in a commercial building. Now, let me conclude. This presentation explored understudied installation and performance art project, ephemeral art forms that have not been meant for normative display in galleries or museums, and certainly not intended for the profitable art market of the Gulf, Western countries, or Iran. Rather than creating art objects for financial gain that would sell in the lucrative markets of Dubai, artists who create ephemeral art and interactive art projects attempt to create immediate change on the ground. An important characteristic of these new art forms is that they steer interactivity rather than productivity, an aesthetic economy based on emotional and physical engagement with art sites and viewers of art. Interactivity generates other systems of value that place art above mere aesthetic, monetary, or propagandistic values. This form of art is often temporary and involves sensory and bodily engagements, a phenomenon evident not only through art practices, but also by the language used by artists that I interviewed for this research. And these terms that they use include ta'amul garoi, dialogic, and dargiri engagements. It appears that among Iranian art circles, these terms have moved to the center of the discourse, replacing the previously more common term didan or seeing art. In addition to exploring art, this presentation was also an argument for the creation of spaces and practices that produce new modes of experiencing the world and novel ways of thinking the counter institutions, alternative art spaces, and unconventional curatorial practices in this presentation are essential, not only for producing novel forms of art, but also for dismantling the hegemonic power. I hope that you have come away from this presentation with an appreciation for all the creative agents who perpetually transform Iran's culture from below and against all odds including the sanctions placed upon Iran that has really limited cultural production. As my own words fall short, I close this presentation by borrowing from Margaret Mead, who says, quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that incredibly rich talk. Um, 
Professor Creamy. Um, I would like to now um, ask members of the audience um, if they would like to um, type in a question to the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Alternatively, you can um, use the raise hand function and we will spotlight you, which will allow you to ask your question verbally. I want to turn the floor over um, to Professor Cezanne Bayabi, who's going to start us off with the first question this evening. Absolutely. Uh, hello, Pamela. How delightful to have you here. I'm sorry I wasn't there earlier to welcome you. I want to thank you for this really very interesting, provocative and rich presentation, which uh, has made me think a lot about uh, many different things, but I want to wrap my questions into one, if I can. So there may be more than one strand to this question, but I, I would be happy to elaborate further. So the question goes something like this. First of all, the, uh, what you presented is a compelling image of uh, contemporary arts in Iran that has uh, detached itself from the sort of hegemonic, as you named it, the commercial, the commodification, where you can own things through the auction houses, galleries, and so forth. And as a result, it seems to have really had no choice but to go into uh, the conceptual, the performative, the temporary, uh, and that there is an aesthetic in there that is already, to my, to my eyes at least, uh, rather elitist, and, and uh, perhaps you can even speak of belated in terms of how it enters the scene. It's really interesting to me to think of two related points and ask you to perhaps reflect on them. One of them has to do with a question that has been asked often, which is what happens to art in Iran, the cutting edge arts in Iran, if we remove the regime and its particularities of performance restriction and so forth. And secondly, can you think of a way to explain or help us understand why conceptual art of Iranian, Iranians in diaspora does not quite um, exist even? So in other words, there is a, a a very sharp distance between uh, what we understand to be contemporary art by Iranians in diaspora and what happens in Iran and the absence of a conceptual, if you will, uh, in the diaspora context is quite striking actually. Uh, perhaps not a total absence, but at least uh, not the prominent form as we see it in the inside Iran actually. Right. Were well, there too many you. questions embedded in that? Uh, I no, 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 no. Thank you so much, Susan, for, for these very, very um, interesting comments, questions, um, um, and thought provoking ideas. Um, uh, the first question about what happens if the regime ends, um, I don't know. And I don't <laughs> actually think that um, it really matters because I think that good artist, a good artist is an artist who responds to, to the social, political, and, and aesthetic circumstances in which she or he lives. And we have seen examples of this um, everywhere, examples of good artists who have responded to these situations uh, from Cuba to um, uh, former Eastern Bloc countries and to the Soviet Union and so on and so forth. What happened after the fall of the Berlin Wall to art in East Germany or in uh, the Soviet Union? Well, you know, they continue to respond to their uh, uh, social and political issues. Um, for example, a lot of artists today in former um, East Germany, uh, they respond to um, issues of immigration and, and things of that nature. And that's totally appropriate. I don't think that Iranian art is going to be weakened uh, or less uh, interesting if, um, if the political pressure is not there. Uh, these are just very, very talented talented, hardworking people who are responding uh, to the situation in which they live. 
Um, in terms of the comparison between uh, what happens in diaspora and what happens in Iran, and this is very interesting to me because actually this inspired the idea of um, looking at Iran more carefully because as you know, every time we open um, uh, uh, an art history book, uh, we see examples from a famous uh, diasporic artists here who do photography and who cater to um, audiences who want to see certain things uh, from the Middle East, um, you know, calligraphy, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, women in, uh, um, in um, in hijab and and so on and so forth. And by no means, you know, this is a criticism of their work. Um, you know, our, our artists, um, uh, you know, just respond to what is uh, required of them. Um, and so I don't I don't blame them for doing this. But on the other hand, I think that we do really need to separate um, diasporic art of Iranians from what happens inside Iran. And through these projects, these installations, uh, these site-specific projects, or maybe I should say site-oriented projects, I try to show what does not enter the art market and what does not end in art history, canonical literature, because these works are temporal. These works um, uh, are not documented well. And uh, quite honestly, a lot of people don't know about them. Mm. Thank you. Good. I'd like to um, go to the raised hands questions first, and then we've got a number of questions in the chat. So if everyone would, um, I thank you for all um, bringing these questions to my attention, and we will get through them um, as they as they come.